Hello and welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia podcast. Today we're going to do things a little different. We're going to discuss this long lost documentary and then we're going to get into an interview with Salome Topuashvili about Soviet Georgia films. Because we had a unique opportunity this year since starting in November and December, we had one month long film retrospective um, hosted by the Georgia National Film Center. It was quite incredible. It was one month long of all these films, some that were already seen before and some completely unknown, like the documentary Their Kingdom, which was co-directed in 1928 by Nutsa Roroberidze and Mikhail Kaltozishvili, Galatozov for Soviet Georgia Cinema Trust. It was actually considered lost until 2008 when it was discovered. And we had this amazing, really amazing ability to see it. Uh, I don't believe it is in its, its completely, its entirety. I believe it was a part of it. It was about 15 minutes long, which I even taped. I like have a really bad cam copy, which we can share with anyone who's interested in learning from the film, not so much to see it in its own beauty, because it's a very bad cam copy, since apparently I'm not very good at doing that. This was really amazing because it's a critique of the Menshevik government. It's actually an interesting format. It's kind of like 15 minutes of like memes, like like trolling the, the Menshevik government, um, the First Republic, which I found um, very interesting. The problem also was that the retrospective didn't have time to translate uh, some of the, um, well, actually the film is silent film. And so it'll show like these um, screens where it's just like r- words are written on it to understand the context. And unfortunately, it's only in Russian. We also translated some part, well, all of it actually, and which we'll put on this terrible chem copy of ours so people can see it. But it's interesting what we gathered from it, let's say. So let's dive into the film. So it begins, and it says something like this. After the collapse of the all-Russian Constituent Assembly, the Georgian Mensheviks, dignitaries of the Russian Revolution themselves imagining the revolution as a huge shock that would soon to be released by universal tenderness, not without regret about the scale, decided to be satisfied with the creation of a demonstratively democratic paradise in little Georgia in tactical agreement with the Western European bourgeoisie. Um, So what's interesting is that they are emphasizing, and this is, by the way, a quote by Avalov, and it's an emphasis on democratic, on little Georgia, there's some experimental of so-called democracy, but in reality, they're saying it was controlled by Western European governments. And then the entire film proceeds to show that this is actually true. So they show the Georgian crest, St. George, people are leaving dressed up, priests getting out of train, priests walking down. These are like the images that are being shown. So showing like, sort of elites. Then they show then they have a um statement. The Allies and the Central Powers vied with each other to rush to the rich Caucasian deposits. Germany was experiencing a psychosis for raw materials, while British detachments guarded Baku oil for Dutch shell. And this is a quote from Ludville Denny, who is a journalist and wrote a book called We Fight for Oil. And it's showing, um, the book is about the sort of scramble for oil 
in Georgia is being, well, the Caucasus is a part of that story of the, of the Western bourgeois governments, especially Germany, trying to control its shares to, to aid in development. Of course, we know World War I was about you know resources and Germany sort of being iced out by other imperial powers to, to um, develop their, their capitalist um, in, industry. After this quote, in showing process of refineries and manganese, workers are working. And it shows the Allied Supreme Council recognized Georgia and Azerbaijan on the condition that their governments would give preference to British and French firms. Standard Oil opposed the recognition of the counter-revolutionary Caucasian governments under the shoe of, Dunning, of Downing Street and Dettering. And it's again a quote by Ludwell Denny. And there's some sort of incredibly gorgeous shots of sort of oil bursting out from the ground. I mean, I don't even know how they did that. They're showing mines, mining in Jayatura. And then there's, you know, um, again, showing that this is about extraction. It's about resources and control. So that's why they have all these shots. Uh, and then they show this, like, man was saying, with small glass, but with great feeling, a man is drinking I drink to prosperity, he says, for this small yet beautiful Georgia. And then um, it looks like a military parade. And it's hard because they keep showing all these shots are sometimes hard to decipher what's happening. But you kind of get a sense that it's either rich people or people who are, you know, like Mensheviks who are dressed up as sort of bourgeoisie. They have all these foreigners around. And this one's military walking around, hands on their chest, Kind of like the style, like when I, you have sort of the military style of putting your hand in your coat. And they showed Independence Day. And they're reading something in front. It's a German officer, I believe, uh, or someone else that's a foreigner that's walking around with the government officials. And so this is like showing, they're saying like Independence Day of the Georgian Socialist and, and, and uh, Workers Republic. And so each single time they show a word like of the Georgian. Then they show foreign troops in Georgia. Then they'll say socialist, and then they'll show these like sort of fat priests, Orthodox patriarchy, you know, um, it's kind of like a saying it was controlled by the Orthodox Church. And then they show independent, and they show more foreign troops, and they show naval ships, these huge sort of scary naval ships. And then they say democratic, and then they show these suits, you know, elites and priests, and like all these people in suits and more priests. And then they'll say workers, and then they'll show these foreign soldiers again. So the workers are not even really included. The only time we see workers are when they're actually working for these companies that are controlling Georgia. Um, and then they're saying peasants, um, and they show businessmen, <laughs> foreigners again, republic. And then they're showing these like shots of sh like black top hats and gloves, you know, like businessmen. And then they have these like. This I thought was very like a like a very big diss, and it's saying minor nobles, and it's, this is describing sort of the Menshevik government. Minor nobles by birth, petty bourgeois by upbringing, democratic rulers by recognition, almost socialist, designed to restore. Order in the democratic paradise with quotes. And they're like showing four soldiers, nurses. It looks like with U.S. flags, like nurse sisterhood or something. And, and then they show president of the Republic, Noah Jordania, saying quotes and then showing images that contradict it. Like the Armenian people will find the same protection with us as they found with the Georgian aristocracy. Is Jordania saying it. And then they show the war with Armenia in 1920. Then they say, quote by Jordania, we're paying special attention to the deep tra tragedy of the Muslim people. And then they show a cannon being loaded to like shoot at Muslims. And they're like, so showing motherland is in danger and the bridge is being blown up because the motherland is like Georgia's in danger. So they're like blowing up their neighbors. And then they show another one that was I thought was very damning with about Ossetia. The Georgian Democratic Republic guarantees civil and political rights to all nationalities within the, its borders. 
they quote this, the act of independence, and then they show a setia and like dead people, they're being killed by Georgians. Um, and then they go on the last part. This is like the first half of the of the film, and the last half is like showing is these uh, General Cook Collis, His Excellency, with meeting with Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, Gekichkori. And with like an entourage and they're like having drinks and they're making deals and, you know, like it's a, it's, it's sort of looks like, well, you know, Kao Tazov did actually uh, direct Soy Cuba, you know, I am Cuba. And so it is very similar in that, like when you have these like foreigners who are, you know, drinking and they're like, it's like, they're enjoying, um, you know, these poor people's like countries, you know, like they were sort of, um, stealing from from cuba you know same thing here but uh, and with their the sort of collusion with the petty bourgeoisie in this case the the um the democratic republic of georgia the government itself and it's saying like i have the honor to confirm that the presence of allied troops in your country is consistent with the general scheme of international peace and tranquility i believe that's cook uh Kokalis is saying that. And Kegichikori goes, Georgia cannot go through this crucible of trials alone. She asks for help from England and wants to know what England wants in return. And then um, Georgia, which is near to the Near East, should be of interest to the UK. And our proposal are as follows. The Batumi region is transferred to Georgia. The port is provided to the British as a military base and a coast coal station on the Black Sea. Um, so Gekichkori pretty much gives, like the, the Georgian government gives control of Batumi to, to the British, right? It's like secedes territory. Um, then it's saying foreign capital is a necessary factor in bringing value into a country, that's what the newspaper says. And we do not see any point in refraining from working together with the bourgeoisie. The main subject of negotiations was determined without difficulty. There was no need to invent it or oppose it. It was the Jiatura Manganese. The building of German-Georgian relations will be erected on this black stone. And it's a quote by Avalov. And then Jordania is like at the end showing saying, I prefer the imperialists of the West over the fanatics of the East. So it's a really damning um, film, uh, documentary film. I would say it's like a um, propaganda piece. I would say it's like a, you know, a meme <laughs> in today's world, like memes and trolling. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good you know, and interesting in a way that it's done because um, there is a resurgence of uh, framing the first republic as a, you know, a utopia, like the Paris Commune or something. It was like this beautiful moment where everything was perfect and everything would have been perfect if you just let first republic um, live. And how it was really democratic and it considered all ethnic nationalities and it's protected them and everyone had civil rights and so on. And it's it, this, you know, their kingdom, Mati Samipo, um, is a a very different outlook, let's say. It tells a very different story. So you have really like two stories. You know, one story is we had this beautiful moment. You know, Georgia was able to have this credible democratic, social democratic paradise um, that was moving towards, you know, and if you fit their liberals, it's like some liberal democracy or if they're not liberals, they're more, you know, more socialist or more left, they'll say this like real socialism, right? Democratic socialism. And the Red Army invaded and destroyed this beautiful spark and then unleashed this like terror and authoritarianism. Um, and the other story, the counter to that really, you know, of the story that their kingdom tells us is that actually this was not a democracy because they're questioning in the, the words like the key words here, right? Were they independent? Well, they're showing, no, they weren't. They weren't independent. They were actually pretty much like occupied by foreign capital, even foreign, foreign military. So how were they independent? It was just Western governments doing it. 
Two, were they really democratic? No, because it's foreign capital and the, the government and the priests are making all the decisions, right? It's not really a worker state. Um, and so, and were they really socialists? It's like, well, at this point, it's hard to, to comment, but they're not even showing socialists. They're pretty much just showing in this way, it's a cultural critique of um, all this, like they have, they love these bourgeois, you know, finery, right? So they're like constantly partying and these black hats and so on, um, which is like one of the most uh, easiest way to to describe or characterize or caricature the bourgeoisie with these top hats and gloves and drinks and parties all the time, right? And if we have to imagine, especially during that time, most socialists are really against this kind of. Um, lavish luxurious like lifestyle of the of, of the decadent right the decadent bourgeoisie so this story is, is saying no the menshevik government was just like a pawn of the western imperialist governments used by one or another in their quest to get strong and powerful they didn't care anything about georgians right georgian government claims to protect the civil rights of their um, minorities, yet showing that that's not true. They are killing Ossetians. They are warring with um, with Armenians and so on. And so even that is being questioned, right? Um, and so what does it mean then? Was this really a beautiful moment where everything was going great? Where if you just let the socialist uh, first republic, you know, if without the so-called um, red, you know, red takeover, as they like to say, um, would it have been a beautiful, you know, liberal socialist democracy like style of like, you know, Sweden or so on? Um, and of course, this documentary saying no. Um, it was never set up that way. It was just a colony, a banana republic um, that was being, you know, being controlled by others and not, and also it didn't, it seemed like also internally the, the bourgeois, um, bourgeois society that they were fighting against was kept in place, showing the priests and again, the parties and the way visually they looked, right? They chose that life, so they chose that that hab habitus, like how to live, like um, petit bourgeois, and kept the same power structures, like the church, um, to control people. So, I know in that way it's interesting, especially so that it kind of comes around 2021. We're seeing this in a retrospective um, because it's the first republic being romanticized is like very much at its peak now um and to show this other story and of course it wasn't restored so i don't even know if a lot of georgians could even understand what was being written because it wasn't translated um no no one else who doesn't speak russian i don't know if they will understand it and it's also so quick because it wasn't restored it was really bad quality so i don't know if you have a chance to really like see it and absorb it i again i i vid videotaped it and so i was able to like sit down and like watch it carefully to really grasp what what they were trying to say and again some scenes i couldn't even see very well but i will um link that youtube with this podcast so people can can see it for themselves I thought it was quite profound. And now we will um, go into our next segment, which is an interview uh, with Salome Topurashvili. <laughs> Well, I am uh, Salome Tsopurashvili, <laughs> obviously, and I am an assistant professor at Ilya State University. And uh, the, my research field is uh, gender and uh, early Georgian Soviet cinema. So, and like the research which I am focused on and on which like I wrote my dissertation on and now I'm working on a book project is about like how women we are represented in 1920s Soviet Georgian silent films. 
uh, and like what we are like the traditional attitudes we are taken by the filmmakers and how the shift in gender representations changed by the end of 1920s uh, because like, like uh, it was the time when the women's emancipatory discourse was very ardently present in the press and um, not only in the press but like there were like huge steps taken towards amelioration of women's conditions and so how all these changes and how like creation of a new Soviet uh, woman like was reflected in the films. Maybe we can discuss um, what are the, well, like, again, like how did cinema develop in Georgia and what were the, what was the role of women or how were women depicted? Like set the stage for people to, who don't know that much about cinema in Georgia to like understand it. Uh, cinema actually in, in actually cinema in Georgia developed like during uh, I mean starting developing like quite early during the Russian imperial times uh, so uh, it's um, like I mean the first like uh, Lumiere's films we are screened in 1896 uh, and the, like it, there is a like a notice like Pattered in the like, like what we know from the magazines, which was one of them, like Snobis Furcelli, a leaflet of news, which was claiming that the first Lumiere films uh, we are like. Uh, in, uh, 19, in 18, 96, November, uh, 14 November. So it was quite early, actually, because um, I mean, in, uh, in, in Russia, in Petrograd, they had premiere in May. And so already in November, they are premiering in Tbilisi. Uh, and uh, so, and uh, it was like, um, it had a huge impact like everywhere around the world. Uh, and of course, like in the beginning, it had like the reputation of being like a popular entertainment and entertainment for lower classes. Uh, and uh, so, and uh, in, the, in, in the beginning, first year we were like this traveling um, stationary cinemas, like not stationary cinemas, but actually not, sorry, it's like a wrong English word, which I'm using. They were like uh, people like cameramen would travel these films and would like set um, uh, um, in different towns and villages, they would set up like to project the films. So it was in the 1900s, uh, in the beginning of the 1900s. So people were like traveling, um, people in charge of like screening the films would travel. And also like, the, uh, for example, uh, Alexandre Dirmelo and his father, uh, who was, who, who became one of the first Georgian cameramen, they also had like this kind of a program. They adopted a pseudonym of like Jim Morris and they would travel uh, in Georgia and also outside of Georgia uh, and they would present their repertoire which consisted of the moving images which included like Lumiere's film and also um, this year um, uh, how to say um, uh, this were like the magic, they would, they were using the magic lantern, uh, they were, which was like the specific um, um, apparatus, which would like make the uh, steel images move. So, and they were using the illustrations of Night of the, with the panther skin. And so their program was very popular. Uh, and, um, um, and so then uh, actually, uh, Alexander Dirmelo, uh, like when uh, he, uh, then he went for him military service and he returned he started working in the stationary cinema of Sofia Ivanitskaya who was like this businesswoman from Odessa uh, a widower of a Russian official uh, and who had um, uh, um, who had like um, uh, established the first stationary cinema Illusioni in Tbilisi and so and he he started working in, in, in her studio uh, and uh, himself, he started shooting like short documentaries. Uh, and uh, the first film he shot uh, and which had like a huge premiere uh, in, in, in Ivaniskaya's theater, it was promenade at Tbilisi Ipodrome. It was in 1910. Uh, but meanwhile, also Vasila Mashukeli, another pioneering camera, Georgian cameraman, uh, at this time was in Baku. And there he like shot his first films in 1907, 08, sorry, 1908. So actually it's like, um, uh, whenever there is a, like a discussion, like which is the date of the uh, first Georgian film made, uh, they usually like cite um, uh, Vasila Mashukeli's film because also like he like shoot this film in Baku, but then he returned to Georgia and, and continued his work here and became like the author of the first Georgian full-length documentary traveling of Akakit in 1912. 
1912. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's like um, uh, news reels and documentaries. We are like um, shot, like by uh, Dirmelo and um, uh, but the first Georgian feature film, uh, it was uh, the idea of the, the making first Georgian feature film was conceived by Germane Gogitizen, who was also a very cinema enthusiastic businessman. Uh, and he himself had um, his own theater in, Zul in Ozurgeti. Uh, and while he was watching like just one of the imported films, he had this idea, oh, why not to shoot a film on a Georgian theme? Uh, and so, and he had like this idea to film Egdat Adinoshvili's a short scrum, uh, short story, uh, Christine, uh, which later became uh, the like, first Georgian uh, feature film before so Georgia Sovietization. Uh, and um, uh, it was, uh, we know that it's like, uh, it was shot uh, in 1960, 1917, uh, and uh, probably was finished in 1918, but it had a pre premiere in 1919, already uh, in the Independent Republic of Georgia. Um, in the Independent Republic of Georgia. Uh, and um, uh, also, like, um, uh, what um, uh, it's like the, um, however, to say that when the Georgia uh, became Sovietized, uh, when Georgia became Sovietized, and actually the Soviet Georgian film studio was actually based on the, like, uh, was based on the, um, uh, on the film studios which existed before. Uh, it was the film department of Tsekhov uh, Shiri. It really belonged to Georgian public organization, which had this name and it formerly was uh, the union of the South Caucasus cooperatives uh, and also a um, uh, joint stock film company Filman, which was headquartered in Baku, but also had an office in Tbilisi and in head was, um, and its head was in Tbilisi was uh, Vladimir Barsky, which was a Russian filmmaker. So, so Salome, the first, uh, just to go back for a second, could you just talk about, you know, what kind of films were being produced, released and watched during the First Republic? Um, actually, I mean, if, uh, if we look at the like the notices in the periodicals of this time, uh, there are usually announcements that there is a, like a cinematography playing at this and this club, and there is a, like a cinematography going will be shown at this and this grand promenade, uh, which we are like advertised at a charity uh, organization and like to collect money for various causes. But uh, in most cases, uh, the which films we are screened, it is not mentioned uh, in Georgian press. Uh, because, uh, I, and the reason for this is that because cinema was not uh, yes, yet perceived as a serious um, art form or art in general. And there were actually very ardent debates whether cinema could be considered as art and how it could like um, equal theater and the uh, like the uh, decision was that no it cannot theater will be like above or cinema or, or always and forever um, so, so it's like the what kind of films we are like shown there is a little known about it uh, but for example, we know that there are real like documentaries which we are like produced in Georgia. Uh, it was actually uh, one of the, for example, a, a huge earthquake which happened in Georgian town Gori in 1920. Uh, from these periodicals, we know that uh, the earthquake scene was filmed on the documentary uh, afterwards of the earthquake was filmed and it existed. Uh, and it was like, uh, I, I mean, in one of the um, I mean, it, 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 I, I don't remember exactly in which context where, where I read about like this documentary, but it was filmed. Uh, and um, also like, for example, uh, wherever like uh, well, it would be uh, in the, the Chronicles, which we are also shoot, it was, for example, when um, uh, the German Social Democrats uh, uh, delegation arrived in Georgia uh, under the guidance of Karl Kautsky. This we are also shot by Germane Gogitidze. Uh, we also know that he filmed like this um, the state the um celebration of like a parade of the during the Georgia's Republic one anniversaries. So uh, I mean the, I mean this we are the documentaries which we are like um, uh, the, the chronicles which we are shot. Uh, as for the feature films, which kind of feature films we are uh, we are screened, uh, the, I mean, um, uh, it is like, uh, um, uh, for example, uh, the information which I have encountered, it is a Russian filmmaker, Evgeny Bowers, revolutionary. Uh, this film was screened in Georgia. Uh, this, uh, and, uh, and, um, 
and it, and it gained like very popularity. It was like very popular, uh, and uh, and because like also Ivan Perestiani had worked on its script, and so and later when he was approached to film Arsena Georgievshvili, uh, the first uh, Georgian Soviet Georgian film was also like because he had uh, I mean he was in Georgia at the time in Tbilisi, but also like he had like this experience of working on this kind of films, so like on the revolutionary theme. So this was also one of the reasons why he was approached with this with this request, and not Vladimir Barsky, for example, who like had been established here for a longer time. Um, uh, and um, also, like for example, we also know from the periodicals that Vladimir Barsky had shot had shot like some um, feature films, but these films are lost. So uh, it's like it is very difficult to say like what kind of it was but uh it's like um it, it would have been like just like um i mean judging from Polarsky's later films which he shot already already under um the soviet georgian film industry it would have been just like very exotic melodramatic things okay so what happens afterwards like what are the rest of the 20s looking like what are kind of some of the films happening developing the 20s and what is like example of like one film maybe you can use as a um as an archetype or something you can just you know that that maybe encompasses the decade and then let's talk about the 30s after that what happens afterwards how does it change um actually it's like the uh, when it comes to 1920s uh this is such an eclectic and such a pluralistic period and such a rich period that it is like very extremely difficult to single out just one film as an archetypical in uh, in terms of um uh because um uh it is like um it is very rich and also the uh, representations and the film techniques and film devices which the filmmakers are using is also very uh, drastically changing throughout the decade. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, I mentioned that the first um, Soviet Georgian film was Arsena Georgievshvili on a revolutionary theme, uh, which was like, and uh, it was like um, uh, dedicated uh, to the, the uh, actual revolutionary hero, Arsena Georgievshvili, the eponymous hero, who uh, actually killed General Grasnov, who was the one of the like sworn enemies of the Georgian uh, revolutionaries in 1905 in a terrorist attack. Uh, and um uh, and and he was like hanged uh because of this arrested and hanged and so and the first the first film which like was like that the georgian cinema section in released was dedicated to like to this hero but the thing is that uh, actually it is um um Akaki Bakradze, the georgian um uh, film film and literary critic he mentions in his memoirs that uh ivan perestiani who was the uh, who was who directed arsena georgia Shrili, he confided in him uh that that actually the idea of filming this film belonged to the uh, government of the Georgia's independent republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Georgia. Uh, and because they wanted to actually launch the national cinema uh, and uh, they wanted to like start like this national cinema, like with the grand epopee, which would depict now uh, the struggle of Caucasia against like Tsarism. And so Andersena Georgia really was supposed to be the first film of the epopee. And uh, and uh, that's the filming started before uh, Bolsheviks invaded Georgia. Uh, but then the filming process, like actually, then continued without any impediment. And later it was like, um, and uh, it, I mean, it continued without any impediment. Uh, they didn't make any changes. And then later it actually was very uh, fruitful and very useful for Bolshevik propaganda. Because interestingly, it was uh, the first uh, film on the uh, revolutionary theme, not only in Georgia, but in the whole Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, also, but then, for example, then Berestiani shifts like that. He makes Suram Fortress, uh, which is uh, already uh, bay, which is already uh, a literary adaptation of the Georgian writer's text. Uh, and uh, but what what he does there? It's actually he breaks like huge amount of exotization and orientalization. Uh, and so, and actually, like looking at uh, through these films on Georgian ethnography, it is everything but Georgian ethnography uh, and like and everything like the for example like Georgian peasants would like dress or like like they would like live in what kind of houses because it's like like very much it's very oriental and it's very like a Pasha Harden like and 
so on and so forth. Uh, and um, so, um, and um, uh, I mean, uh, the themes like uh, we are like, which we are used in 1920s, the main sources of for the inspiration uh, for the scripts, we are the literary text adaptations, uh, and also like the lives of the famous like brigands. Uh, and, uh, but um, also like um, uh, in order to strengthen these um, exotic and uh, exotics of the Caucasus, like the whole uh, characters we are invented and reinvented, uh, and also like the the main the main emphasis would be put on like women's bodies and on women's sexualities, and so and um, it's like um, um, I mean this was like the main stake that um, the um, uh, that the studio was putting on, uh, and but also uh, the thing is that, um, uh, but um, also the thing is that then the in the by the end of the 1920s already this is the time when the leftist uh, binded filmmakers entered the scene, uh, and uh, for example now they like in the. Uh, in the film, uh, like in the film studio, starts works uh, starts. Uh, Nikola Shengelaya starts working. Who was a, like a left member, like the left art as the rebel, like the leftist idea, and uh, it's like um, I mean, for example, he also takes literary text adaptation. Uh, he also like uses the historical um, uh, texts uh, like uh, um, Alexander Asbekis Ellison, a short story. Uh, but for example, what he does there with the Caucasus is completely different. Uh, and what he does there to women's images uh, also. Uh, it's like there is no orientalization, no exotization. It is a, like a livable space. Uh, and uh, it is a, like, a, it is not like some um, fairy tale-ish harems and pashas and oriental dancing and um, like sword fighting. I mean, there are like a sword fighting and there is dance, but it is done in a completely different manner than it was to, to be before. And so it is done without camera subjectification, without orientalization, and they are the dance, like uh, it serves to the semantic game, which is like to overcome the grief and to find the energy to like, to continue uh, to continue life with uh, after the huge loss, so and um, so it is a, it is a, like a, it is a really huge turn in terms of like representation and using of like the film devices and everything. So to say in short. So so you're saying uh, if I could like summarize it, there was an orientalizing sort of uh, gaze before, and there's like a new wave that attempts to be a lot more realistic, right? By using different absolutely, devices. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, more, more realistic and also more ideologically oriented as well. Like, you, know, um, you know, thinking back on like the little knowledge I have of Georgian film, it's always played a huge institutional role of politics, right? Uh, either yes, yes. pro-Soviet or anti-Soviet towards the end, you know, it's very uh, politicized. It can be, it's an instrument that can be used for all different kinds of propaganda, you know? Um, that's very interesting that, so the imperial period had more of the orientalizing or um, is it the the early 19, I, I, I think I missed that. So during the, the first Republic, it's more about like, like heroic stories, right? And then it becomes more realistic afterwards, if I understand mm -hmm. it correctly. Or not? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, what I was saying is that it's like um, uh, it's uh, it's in the beginning. It's the first half of the 1920s when it is like uh, more heroic and more orientalization and more exotica. And then it's like the deorientalization happens in the end of the 1920s. Uh, okay. uh, during the imperial period, we only have the some um, uh, even Christina, which was the only uh, one Georgian feature film, is not conserved in totality. It's like only twenty minutes are remain from there, and so and it is very difficult to judge and like to discuss like on the whole film uh, how it could be and what kind of scenes it would feature like because we only have like some twenty minutes or eighteen minutes out of it left. So what's happening to women during the 20s? How are women depicted or what are the themes? Um, so the themes, uh, when it's, uh, it's like these women are uh, 
object, objectified and sexualized. And they are, um, of course, if they are good women in terms of like they are like from the lower class, they are uh, they need to they are victimized. They need to be saved. And the lower class men, I mean, they are counterparts. They cannot save them because they also do not have this power in this like uh, in this cruel Tsarist imperial system to save they are lovers or they are sweethearts and they all fail and so uh, and um uh, it it's like um, um so it's like and we so it's ended and the come the way the camera depicts women it is also like where they like represent women as a we image within an image and like as a, like a, a site to be looked at and like so they they kind of fetish, fetishize women uh but uh, it's like um uh, but in the uh, end of the 1920s then it's already different and for example like then the film which i mentioned already this nicola shengelaya's elisa which was like this one of the groundbreaking films uh, celebrated by both georgian and russian press uh, as the, among the production of the Georgian uh, film studio. Uh, it was uh, like, um, here a woman is not objectified anymore and she's not victimized at all. And she's uh, like, um, uh, she she possesses agency and she is uh, someone who is enabled to resist authorities and to make uh, her own decision as uh, about her life, her body and, um, uh, and about like and about the nation as well to some extent. How was this new image of women received, both by the people who went to see the films or by the people who were writing about films in the Soviet press in Georgia? Um, uh, this it was uh, Elisa had like a huge furor, and they had I mean she, it it got like a, amazing reviews. Um, I mean from Georgian press and from Russian press as well, uh, and uh, and it's like uh, we it, uh, I mean we I mean it's like it is difficult to judge about what like particular pe people thought about it. Uh, but uh, I mean there is like a, a newspaper, for example, like in one of the newspaper articles, it is mentioned that people's reaction when they watched Elisa. So, and it was like it was like a funny, uh, sub, I mean, somewhat a funny comparison. It was like there was like a screening arranged for the workers and for the peasants. And uh, so at first they watched like Eisenstein's October and everyone was puzzled and everyone didn't know what was going on and everyone was bored. And then Eliso started and everyone became like very agitated and very enthusiastic and they like embraced the movie very much. So because I mean, of course, like Eisenstein's film is like, are like we are like very difficult to grasp uh, for the ordinary audience all that time, and this was actually basically one of the reasons why in the end of the 1920s already there is like this uh, formalism becomes like such a um, how to say uh, a damning word sort of to say uh, that uh, it's like that uh, uh, because uh, I mean no matter like how the filmmakers these avant-gardist filmmakers we are enthusiastic about delivering uh, ideological messages the form which they we are using be it Eisenstein or Verdo uh, it was like it was intelligible for the message and uh, there was there was a need for the uh, films which would be intelligible for the millions as the famous slogan was put already in the beginning of the 1930s how does it change then so the women how do how does the role of women or how they're gazed upon changes over time um over time so uh, it's like um uh, this, there is like this very interesting thing Thing that uh, whenever, like um, uh, in the beginning, I mean, as I said, they are all vulnerable and objectified, and then like they are becoming a a a agents, active agents themselves, and it is also like, also, like to happen to to observe what happens to these women who are active agents, and so what happens to these women who are like the embodiment, the quality embodiments of the qualities of the new Soviet woman, because I mean, uh, of course, like Eliso is like said in the historical. Caucasus, it's a literary text adaptation, which like the end of which is changed for the ideological purposes, of course. Uh, but uh, the, it's like um, um, that the, what, what happens is that uh, I, uh, I, I mean, um, uh, I mean, they when they become when the women become bearer of the gaze, it's like they also like somehow like deny one of the uh, 
characteristics of the traditional feminine. For example, in terms of Eliso, because to meet for the ideological mean, to meet to the ideological needs, uh, which is like to like uh, put on that she stays with her people and to put public interest above private interests uh, for her because private interest is to stay with her lover, uh, but the public interest is like to stay with her people and to go to exile in the Ottoman Empire with her people and her father. And so, and she like says no to her private happiness. Uh, and so she sacrifices her personal happiness for the uh, bigger and for the public goal. And so, and similar things are observed in the, uh, it's observed also in another film, uh, which is uh, also concentrated in, which is set also so in a historical context, but it is, it is already a revolutionary historical context. It's like uh, this too, it happens in 1907 and um, afterwards the 1905 revolution. Uh, and so, and there like there is also a woman, uh, it's, it's called uh, Prison Cell 79 and was filmed by Zakaria Berishvili. Uh, and uh, also, uh, and this it is interesting that this script writer, so yeah, Shalal Hazishvili, a very ardent futurist poet and Leo Sakia who also was very sympathetic with the left ideas and who also became a filmmaker of his or a successful filmmaker of his own later on. And uh, as for example, and, and this film like centers on a woman who is a revolutionary who is uh, exiled in Siberia, who comes back like after like sending spending years there and starts organizing uh, revolutionary workers around her so that they could dig a tunnel, uh, a clandestine talent to the prison cell so that the prison donors could escape. And so and actually it was based on the real events. Uh, it, so it happened in the Kutaisi prison uh, and it was like um, guided by Stalin's group. Uh, this operation and uh, in head was like Mara Bojorice, who was a very famous revolutionary woman. Uh, and uh, actually, this Mara Bojorice is paid tribute by the, with this like now uh, with this uh, main character because her name is Mara Bojorice, so her last name is like just ending is altered. Uh, but other than that, remains the same. And so, and the thing is that they uh, opened like a fake tight shop just in front of the prison, and uh, they were like digging a tunnel to the prison cell, so so. so the workers could escape and actually they did escape in reality around like 40 of them uh, and so and uh, so and uh, so this um uh this event was used by the script writers to make a, like a drama about a woman, uh, like a dramatic story, uh, whose son was adopted by the factory owner and now is a prosecutor. And so, and the thing is that, I mean, uh, in the end of the film, uh, this woman uh, publicly shot her own son on the trial so that the trial got postponed and so that the revolutionary cause of escaping the workers was fulfilled. So, and also, I mean, here also like this is this thing that, I mean, this is like a strong woman. This is also like someone who uh, puts her and uh, who puts public needs and the revolution's needs above her own, to above like her like love towards her son uh, and sacrifices her son towards this cause. Uh, and also like, she also like, she also sacrificed uh, and sacrifice something which is very dear to one and which is also like very much uh, feminine, uh, like something like love and something like mother's love towards child is, is put at stake and it plays like um, it, uh, in favor of the public goods. So actually this is what happens like to women. They like sacrifice, they are best for the state, for the revolution, for the public. In the in the pre-Soviet period, it sounds like film wasn't really taken very seriously as like a thing that was considered art or even and, and wasn't really considered very important in imperial and then even independent Georgian society. But it seems like with the Sovietization and the and the, the that not only were you know, women being like represented differently, but there was also this new role that film played in trying to transmit ideas of social change into the population. So I guess I'm curious, what was it um, and how did film itself change as like a tool of social transformation in the Soviet period in Georgia? Um, I, yes, um, uh, it's like, um, uh, actually like the cinema, uh, the cinema was like, uh, um, um, 
considered by the Bolsheviks like as a weapon and as which by which they as a magic weapon by which they could change the whole society uh, and they like somehow like uh, I mean it could be like said that they had like maybe too much uh, faith into a propaganda power uh, but it was like uh, uh, I mean uh, even like uh, it was like uh, Alex uh, Anatoly Lunacharsky who was the uh, commissariat of uh, people's education people's enlightenment or people's in a commissariat of the people's enlightenment and he well, like and he 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 quoted Lenin saying that a uh, cinema uh, is most important of all arts for us because cinema is like can change people and we can deliver our messages towards uh, to, for population uh, i mean it's like some uh, some historians are are like now um, uh, um, dubious, like to what extent, like uh, this uh, memory is like uh, Lunacharsky can be a reliable uh, witness in this case, because Lunacharsky himself was a very huge enthusiast of cinema and he also was like writing scripts for films and uh, so and so maybe it was like maybe he like it's Lenin did not like maybe did not really say that cinema is the most important of all arts especially considering that his um, taste in arts was actually like quite conservative uh, but uh, Lenin did believe that with cinema it was it could be uh, it would be a, it was an important tool an important tool to disseminate uh, knowledge and to disseminate information for the population which were like uh, illiterate and the um, the most population of the at the time we are illiterate, um, like it, it was like the statistics. So, and the cinema was an amazing medium for that so that they could uh, explain everything to people who couldn't read. Uh, and, and so it was like somehow like uh, considered as the like in international uh, ambassador uh, and uh, so and also like also then another thing was that also so that the cinema was like a new invention it was a modern invention and so aligning with the cinema would also give bolsheviks like that to like position themselves with the modernity and towards the like to, and to and identify themselves with modernity and with the progress uh, contrary to the like the imperial tsarist russia and imperial tsarist empire russian empire uh, and, uh, and and also like, and so it was um, it was actually like this Lenin's this quote like as quoted by Lunacharsky was like used like it was like printed or uh, like uh, in every other journal it was like like citing like that Lenin said that cinema is the most important of arts for us. Uh, and so, and they did indeed believe that with the cinema, uh, they could like really change the society. And since, and in the beginning, uh, it's like even the, it was the cinema trains, which we are supposed to explain the uh, aims of the revolution and the benefits of the revolution towards the population, for, for the population. Uh, because I mean, when the revolution happened, it happened in the uh, centers. Uh, and uh, so, and the like villages, and the countryside remained like uh, untouched by all these like huge events. Uh, and so it's, uh, so there were like the cinema trains, uh, which would like, uh, go like straight like in the countryside and would like project and would show uh, that the uh, we show uh, propaganda films and agit films uh, to, towards to, 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 the, to the population and and also it was like uh, and, uh, and because it was a novelty and it was uh, it, and because it was an uh, object of curiosity uh, the like high attendance would have been guaranteed by all means that everyone wanted to see like what this new thing looked like. So it seems. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, it's one thing that you, one theme, I guess, that you have brought up and that I think it's worth mentioning is that, you know, the, obviously there are changes that happen in Georgia's domestic uh, society uh, during, dur I mean, after Sovietization and film is playing a key role in that. But at the same time, also this entire, this new relationship to film that's being disseminated throughout the entire Soviet Union seems to put a new importance on film and, and affords uh, particular filmmakers, right, the opportunities to do things like go to Moscow to study film. There's a new types of interaction between Georgia and the new Soviet uh, cities, um, such as, you know, Moscow and then eventually Leningrad and stuff. And I'm just curious, you know, to, to what degree are Georgian Soviet films becoming popular at an all-Soviet level 
versus say how they're being received at the local level? Um, uh, so um, uh, it's like, um, uh, uh, actually, uh, there is like this, uh, as I mean, to, to speak about like how Georgian films we are received in local level versus how they we are received on the metropolitan, like uh, that is like this Russian critics level. Um, there is like this interesting that actually Georgian critics are more harsher towards their own films and more critical uh, than the um, uh, than the, for example, the Russian critics. So it's like um, I don't know, maybe like they. Uh, so maybe one of the things of this is that maybe like the Georgians themselves like could sense better the uh, the overwhelming exotization or overwhelming orientalization, which was not a uh, character, which was not authentic for the Georgian ethnography and life being. So they we are like more sensible towards it, whereas like in the like the Russian critics, uh, I mean for them like I mean. Uh, uh, considering the like imperial orientalization legacy, it was like somehow it it, it, it was like it was okay for them, and it was like they couldn't uh, they couldn't sense this. Um, um, how to say? I mean, in the, it was it would fit in their imaginary, but it was not uh, all right, and it wasn't working for the Georgian critics. Also, uh, what to what extent like they we are received? There is also like interesting that Georgian films actually we are very successfully uh, mar they we, they we are very successful on the uh, Russian market and on the also uh, on the old Judean market, uh, and um, uh, it's like. Um, for example, I mean, the first film which I mentioned, Arsena Georgiashvili, which was like a take, I mean, its title for the Moscow audiences was changed and it was like screened as a uh, murder of the General Grasnov. Uh, it was like, it was extremely popular uh, and uh, it's like uh, in the even, in the, I mean, and it was, uh, it, it premiered in 19. 1922, uh, but uh, it, it's like in this the Soviet screen, which was uh, the, the Soviet Russian magazine, a cinema journal, not magazine journal. Uh, it was writing in 1925 that this film is still running on this. Uh, it is this film is still running on the theaters today. And people are now still watching it with like lots of enthusiasm. Uh, also, the, the, also like these uh, um, the, the other Georgian films, like they have made a huge box office seats in Russia. And also, there is also like this thing that when uh, in the first part of the twenties. Uh, of the 1920s, uh, that, uh, when filmmakers we are making these films, they, uh, they we are approaching it also with the business uh, business mind, this marketing mind, and of course, and of course, uh, and they we are like also directing, we are like consciously directing like these films and with this oriental ambience towards the Moscow audiences, like towards the metropolitan audiences. And so, and the and the Georgian films like would become like the box office hits. Even the even those films, which would be like harshly condemned in the press. Uh, I mean, they are like condemned in the press, they are criticized, but people are going there and people are like seeing it and people are loving it. So, I mean, this was also like this kind of a thing. Obviously, um, films, as you mentioned, uh, or at least I should say, in the Soviet period, of course, film is going to be a really important way that the Soviet society is trying to, you know, teach people about what this new modernity, this new Soviet modernity that they're entering is going to be like, both the level of the family, right, gender relations, workers, uh, how people are going to, you know, how people are supposed to be laboring, what the ideals that they're fighting for are, but also um, there's this idea of, you know, what is this new Soviet Georgia? You know, you had mentioned that there was a shift um, in the earlier part of the 20s to the later part of the 20s about uh, the perception of how Georgia's representation in these films um, was being orientalized and um, how it shifted, you know, and it, what's been interesting, I'm interested to know, um, you know, a little bit more about the way that the Soviet period, like what was it about Georgia that the late Soviet film, the late, the films in the late twenties was, were animating about what this new Georgia will be compared to the old Georgia. 
right? What was the old Georgia that was being left behind? And what was the new Georgia that people were going towards? And then the second question in relation to that is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of this film, you know, Salt, Salt for Svanetti, right? Which of course I know, yes, yes. know about. And to me, it was very interesting because this film to me represents, you know, the victory of Sovietization of the Soviet period in modernizing not just um, the cities, but actually being able to connect even the most distant village in the top of the mountains of Svaneti to the rest of Soviet society through the building of the road, of course, which is like the the point of the film, right? That this vi that the village is getting connected to the rest of the world, um, and it's like you're still going to have your village right? Village life is not able to be, you know, done away with the idiocy of village life is not able to be done away with yet, but it will be connected into this new Soviet society. Um, and I'm just, it seems to me like there was a, there was a concerted effort by the Soviet filmmakers to sort of frame this new image of what a modern, uh, you know, what Soviet modernity could look like, even in these most rural and desolate of places within the within the now Soviet Union. So, you know, what what ways do you do you I guess have you seen that the Soviet filmmakers were dealing with this kind of like problem of of leaving behind something in the past and moving towards something different in the future in the specifically in the Georgian context. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, but I mean, before moving to uh, like answering your question, and as you mentioned, like that you uh, love Salt for Swan, the Salt for Svanetti, Miss Kalat also film. I mean, you should also see Nutsakovo Beridzis Buba, which is also on the th same theme. Uh, and it is also like the modernization of the village on the top village in like the, in Raja, in another like high mountainous, uh, uh, high, high mountainous village. Area uh, and also and uh, and it is interesting because I mean Galat uh, and Robert they were collaborators before uh, and so and they had like a they filmed a joint film like they are kingdom which is actually going to be screened like this Saturday uh, by National Georgian Cinema Center in the archives in the state archives of Georgia uh, this Saturday uh, and um, uh, and so they were like collaborators and now then they made their own independent films films almost simultaneously uh, on the same topic. And so it's like, it's it's, it's Svaneti, uh, it's modernization of Svaneti in, uh, in Galat Ozeshuli's films and modernization of Raja in Rogoberic's film. And it is also like very interesting and very fascinating, like how they take like different approaches when actually dealing uh, with the same thing in the same genre, like in the same film genre. So it's, it is very, it is very oh, amazing. Can you, say, I, can you just tell for everybody, what was the name of the film that was the, the Racha one? Um, one more time. Uh, Buba. 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 Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll get that. It's like, and um, I, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, I, I think it is available on YouTube as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and to like, and to, and to now to start to answer into your question, what is there to be left behind and what is there to be embraced? Actually, it is like now in the, uh, in the end of 1920s, actually, there is like this, not only Soviet Georgian phenomena, but the Soviet Union phenomena of cultural revolution, which means, which is like, uh, uh, which is like this, however, like the known as like the Stalinist revolution, in other words. And so, which means that it's like the old, so it's like we are now entering like the new era and we are the old customs and all like the customs which drag us towards the past and which drag us like um, like for reaching the socialist which is like our goal should be stopped and now we should become like now it should become like the country of the new Soviet citizens and what does it mean to be a new Soviet citizen so uh, it's like it's the, which are the films which deal with it uh, in, in, in the Georgian, among the Georgian films which are set in the contemporary Soviet 
Soviet Georgia. It's like one of the examples of his of uh, Michael Chiaurelli Saba, uh, which is like which is called uh, which is focused on the um, uh, eponymous hero, a tramway driver Saba, who is alcoholic. And also, like, and the um, uh, condemning alcoholism, and like, and which which was also like the enemy of the socialism, uh, as like the way it was branded in the press and in the slogans. It's like it is. It is. A, it is a, like a, it, it's anti-alcohol propaganda. It was not only like the uh, Soviet Georgia thing. It was like the. Like it's uh, the I would say the global Soviet global thing, uh, and so and uh, the and uh, but but I mean this film like plays and shows us like what is like the old Georgia like the Soviet old Georgia and what should become a new Georgia and the new Georgia but it's becoming uh, like um, uh, the new Soviet society which is like free of alcohol and if. There is no alcohol. There is no domestic violence as well because these two are intertwined with each other, uh, and um, uh, and it's like the uh, saying no to the alcoholism and the city where there are workers' club instead of taverns, and when there are like club, um, like the uh, how to say the libraries instead of like um these drinking places this is how like the new new space should be like uh also uh it's a, another uh, another like Gio release another film which is also like contrasts like old georgia and new georgia it is also like but it, it is already from the 1930s it is it's it was filmed in 1931 i think or 32 i don't remember exactly but it's either 31 or 32 it's it is it, it's uh, this michael Gio release same Habarda, which is like meant that it's like forward. Uh, and it is also like the actually the whole film is about the changing architecture of the Tbilisi. Uh, and uh, because now there is it is also a propaganda film because now they we are launching this like that the old neighborhood should be demolished and the new house buildings should be uh, built like for the workers, which would be like convenient for everyone. And so and so actually uh, this film, which is a indeed brilliant satire which is really wonderfully made it's like uh, it's uh, and very very ideological, of course, and very very propagandistic. Uh, it's like it's like says that of oh, this like these old remnants, which are like these cultural heritages and people who defend cultural heritages. Actually, they know nothing about cultural heritages, and it's like this new. It's the and uh, it's it's like the transformation of the old Tbilisi into a new Soviet Tbilisi, like from Tbilisi to, to Tbilisi, like sort of to say. And are there any uh, instances of films being made at the Georgian uh, film studio that included other nationalities of the South Caucasus? Like, were there any films that were being made at this time uh, by Georgian directors, you, you know, using um, Aziri or Armenian um, actors or the language or themes? Um, oh, yes, yes. Actually, it is like this. Um, actually, the Georgian studio at this time, it was very international. Uh, it was very international. I mean, uh, it's like, uh, you, for example, even the uh, people who we are working in the Georgian film studio and the first filmmakers who we are like, uh, it was like Vladimir Barsky, who was a uh, um, filmmaker, Russian filmmaker, I mean, of Russian origins, and Ivan Perestiani, who was half Russian, half Italian. Italian uh, and Amobek Nazarov, who was Armenian, uh, and uh, and then it's like the when uh, I mean Georgian film studio employed uh, Georgian not filmmakers but Georgian directors because both Alexandre Tutsunava and Kotemar Janishvili they we are like theater directors uh, and they we are employed by Georgian state film studio in 1924. Uh, and also like the actors, like uh, uh, cameramen, like, uh, 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 or like, I mean, they were, there was like, a, it was very international. Uh, they were Russians, they were Ukrainians, they were uh, Azeris, they were Armenians. And actually, if you like look on the, um, on the titles of the films, like who plays which role, like it is, it is very, this international like character of who is a cameraman or assistant to the filmmaker, it is very obvious. Uh, it is very obvious. And also like, um, 
uh, they we are like making uh, like uh, Georgian filmmakers. We are making films uh, on uh, other than Georgian theme, uh, and also it was also the case that uh, Georgian filmmakers like would travel to the other uh, through the Armenian film studio or to the Azerbaijanian film studio and make films there, and it was like or vice versa, like so it was like or interconnected. For example, like uh, Nikolos Shengalaya's uh, another like the uh, I mean, besides Eliso, he's like or maybe arguably some could suggest that his best film, which is 26 Commissar, he made with Baku Film Studio. And it is like this, it's this 26 Commissar of Baku, like when they we are killed during the like this this Baku revolution. So um I mean it it, it was there was like this internalization. Now, obviously, you know, there's going to be 70 years of Georgian films that are going to be made throughout the entire Soviet period. But if we're going to stay on the theme of this early Soviet Georgian films, what would you say are the biggest contributions to cinematography, Georgian cinematography, uh, and the biggest advancements that are made in the 20s and the 30s that prove to be very important for the trajectory and the development uh, later of Georgian films? Like what are the biggest and most important changes in the early Soviet period that will stay with Georgian film uh, and make it what it will become in the late Soviet period and that is still with it today in the post-Soviet period? Um, so in terms of like, uh, in terms of like representation, and I feel like more secure, like asking, like to the answering to this part of the question, because I mean, this is where I feel confident uh, because I'm like, uh, how to say, I mean, the way I approach cinema, it is like this, uh, it is more about like that. Um, oh, what an interesting social document. So what can we learn about uh, with these documents, like about like the past and about like the society and about like how like this and this functioned and how like it was like articulated and that and that and so like in the sense like uh what uh whatever like was the um, uh what made like this big contribution uh i mean in my opinion is that uh i mean this um uh what uh, actually it is what what is very interesting is that and i want to like return like to this like this or uh, the question of the orientalization again uh is that um i mean uh i i, I mentioned that I mean, these filmmakers we are using the imperial orientalization legacy to film their films. I mean, they we are rooted in this like uh, imperial culture themselves, uh, and also they we are using it and not challenging it because I mean they wanted to make more money out of these films. But uh, all because like these we are films, uh, and of course like the orientalization of Georgian Caucasus is like um, was like very much present from the 19th century in the writings of the Ra Russia uh, writers in the writings of the in, the, in their works. Uh, it was like this with is this uh, films in the Soviet Georgian films it, as they we are like branded national so it was that somehow like it also like uh, it was like kind of a, like a, a double orientalization so to say like the or the, like this uh, filmmaker Swiss uh, imperial rooted in the imperial culture orientalized Georgia and then the Georgian uh, film studio because it, as it was like branded national uh, somehow like orientalized themselves as like like um, produce these films as like national films and like as national cinema, like sort of to say. Uh, and so, and uh, it's like what, um, so it, uh, and so this like this representations of like this, for example, like this uh, excessive alcohol consumption, excessive partying and like, and focusing on this, like the last and um, on, on this, like on this kind of things. Actually this like somehow like, and this of orientalization who is like troublemaker. Uh, I mean, this is like something which like somehow like uh, had a long lasting legacy in terms of representations. And it when the representations which we which we encounter in the late Soviet films as well. And maybe like we have like and maybe like mentally internalized as well, somehow. 
like and uh, and as as for the in terms of the um uh, as for the in terms of the um cinematic uh, devices i mean uh it's um how to say i mean there we i mean what i want to say is that uh, uh we i mean very few and very little amount of films of the of which we are filmed by the Georgian State Film Studio, we are available for the last 30 years, at least, I mean, to start, like, I mean, I don't know what was available during the late Soviet period, because, I mean, I was a little kid at the time, uh, but, I mean, it's like very limited amount of films we are available to see, and so, and the films of the 1920s, it was like somehow like uh, remained in a mystery, and from which, like, uh, you could only read about book, uh, about them in books, like when, like, scholars have, had seen it and written about it, and so you read, like, this somehow, like, the summarization, and now seeing this these films uh, actually like opens like so much more and, and so many fascinating like so many fascinating layers in terms of like uh, using of cinematic devices as well or uh, I, I don't know I mean uh, it is like really like difficult to say because like considering that this films are like really relevation for me. I mean, I had seen like some of the films before and I mean, yes, I work, I did a research on Georgian silent films, but I mean, there is like so much more than I had seen and so much more than there is like there to discover. Like, from, I mean, um, for example, uh, uh, another like amazingly, amazing film, which was like Alexandra Tutsunawa's again, like the historical, uh, film based on a literary novel, um, like it was Revolt in Guria. It is completely fascinating film and it is actually very, very David Griffithian. So, and um, I mean, of course, like David Griffith was like very popular in the Soviet Union and we, we, I mean, and the uh, Hollywood films, we are like of like very uh, largely screened and they were like very popular. Uh, but I mean, and uh, it's like, um, it is so very Griffith yet and it's so amazing. Uh, I mean, and it's like, and it's somehow like, I mean, to us as for example, uh, what like, for example, uh, what, Kind of a which, influence. Book, which, um, which film is that? The, Gur the Revolt in Guria? Uh, Revolt in Guria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one else? And which year? <laughs> At, uh, 1928. 1928. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and actually, I mean, there is like this, like this historical fact, which is like connected to the Georgian Film Studios history, is that, I mean, this film was like it has like huge, massive sense. Uh, there are scenes in which like lots of people are like participating, really, really lots of, and so and so they exceeded like I mean Tutunava exceeded the budget like so enormously that actually then the Germane Gogizidze, who was the head of the uh, executive director of the Georgian State Film Studio, was fired after that. I mean, at least like according to the official numbers, because I mean, he spent like a lot, a lot of like money and a lot of, of the film stock on that because he was like shooting and reshooting. And, 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 and I mean, the film is like really, I mean, completely, I was like uh, mind blown when I saw it. So it's, and so, I mean, in terms of like to speak about like this continuation and about like what was um, what is reflected uh, uh, from 1920s films in the films later on uh, in Georgian films. It's, it is very difficult to say. And also another thing is that in the 1930s, the film politics like changed completely. Uh, and and uh, because like the formalism and innovation and um, when and also the sound film comes. So the, um, how to say, the um, target, how a, how a film should be made and which kind of film should be made remains like completely different from 1920s. So in a way, these 1920s uh, films like somehow um, it is also like another like uh, somehow like could so say to approach that um, they somehow like remained in a vacuum. Maybe I mean. I mean, I'm just like, how to say, like brainstorming right now, because uh, it was not um, to make like such experimental and like uh, films was not allow allowed then to make in the sound film 
era. So it is like um, really very complicated question. I mean, I must say, <laughs> to which I don't think I have a like a really proper answer. Um, so to for our English speaking audiences, um, what is actually translated? Is there anything that has like subtitles in English that can people can like watch? Um, well, um, I mean, uh, these films which are now screened in a retrospective, they are with English subtitles. Uh, they are with English subtitles, but as far, but I mean, I don't know when and in which form now they will be available for the like wider audience to like to see them online. Uh, but uh, as for the, I mean, uh, as for the um, YouTube, which is like I would say like our like shelter like for finding these old films they are can be found got amica berizes my grandmother uh which is uh both with english uh inter english translated english titles as well a completely amazing and mind-blowing film which actually made me to work on my research i mean this this was the film why i decided that oh i want to look into georgia's Soviet films of 1920s and find out what is there. Um, that's actually to my next question. So tell us like, what's your like, your favorite, let's say like, what is your like top five films that you love? And then like what you would, uh, if people were interested in your topic, besides the fact that you have a book coming out, uh, they should check out your book. Um, what else should they do to learn more about this? Um, so my first, it would be Kotemi Kaberitis, my grandmother. And I actually like have a, like a, a personal story. I mean, this film is very personal for me as well, uh, because uh, I was in a very, very, very bad place in my life when my sister decided me that she should take me to see this film which was restored and was like screening in Amirani theater and uh, when I was watching it and it was like I had just got into a like a PhD program and I really did not know anything other than the like the standard like proposal what I want to work on like on, I mean basically I didn't know about what I would be working and I was not even thinking about it at that time and when I started like watching this completely amazing film which is like so brilliant and so avant-garde. And so it was like completely unimaginable that, I mean, something like that could have been made in 1920s. Uh, at the time, I was like that this is going to be in my PhD thesis. So I got a recovery just my grandmother is the film which determined my, in, uh, my research interests and my research career afterwards. So, and it is like completely amazing. And also, I mean, for the uh, English speaking audience, um, I there is a, like this good news that uh, a huge monograph which contains uh, uh, like the essays and also very rich archival materials about this very interesting filmmaker uh, is out in English language. Uh, it is edited by um, uh, Soso Dumbadze and Nino Zanzava, and it's called like Got Amica Berize. Uh, I mean, it bears the title of the uh, filmmaker, of the, the, it bears as a title the name of the filmmaker. And it is like really, really amazing. And it is also available to see on YouTube as well. Uh, and um, uh, so, and um, another one, which I also completely love, uh, it is like this uh, Prison Cell 79 by Zakaria Berishvili. Uh, and then uh, it's like, uh, maybe it does not like really deserve the third place because it is considered as one of the best Georgian 1920s films, but Nicholas Shengelaya's Eliso. Uh, and I do really love uh, I mean, now I cannot say not to say, I mean, these are now new discoveries, but Alexandra Tsutsunawa's Jari Guriashi is, I mean, the revolting Guria is also like enormous and like amazing film. Uh, and, uh, and, and about like to speak about the, like the, Thieves, it would be uh, Michel Giaurelis Habarda, which is already 1932, but still, <laughs> still, still, still silent, still silent. So, so these are my top five 
Georgian Soviet films, which I am sure that everyone would enjoy watching. So. What would you say for someone who doesn't know very much maybe, or is maybe interested in uh, Soviet Union in political ways, right? What would be interesting for them? Like why was film so important? And why was film so important also uh, in the twenties and how did it change in thirties? You can maybe repeat it. And also like um, about like women, you know, like since that's a, that seems to be like an um, important theme as well. What would be like the takeaway, like a summary of it all? Usually, of course, like literature and film are considered as like somehow the subconscious of the period or of the epoch where the uh, all the ideals or fears of the society are manifested. Uh, but uh, and um, and of course, like they are very important social documents. But I mean, it is like particularly. I mean, this aspect of the film industry is particular, and of course, like they always contain propaganda. I mean, uh, in every society, in every culture throughout in every period propaganda or counter propaganda but still it is always ideological to some extent but also uh, what in the soviet context and in the 1920s uh, soviet context it is particularly important because uh, it was officially declared as a weapon for transforming the uh, soviet society and also it was also like uh, it was supposed to offer the role models of the new soviet citizens to the population and also and particularly like how to make the new Soviet woman, which was like a very controversial issue and it was like a, uh, and a very debatable issue in the 1920s, what she should do, how she should look like, what, what is this about, like what this new kind of femininity, which should not be feminine, but should be masculine, but to what, ex to what extent masculine, or maybe we don't like women who is too much masculine. So it was like a very, very huge debate about this. And also like this film represents also uh, were not in the 1920s, were not that successful to provide this like beautiful, like unified role model for that. But I mean, like many, they, we are trying and it is also like very interesting to observe like um, which kind of representation is like um, deals with which aspect and which, in, in which other it fails and so on and so forth. Uh, and. Um, and so, and it is like that it was like really used, and it was also, it was, uh, it is amazing because it also shows us the uh, places and it also shows us the environment that we do not know, I, I mean, we are relieved, but it's, it's like changed uh, beyond recognizable traits it was at some places and how it is like somehow like it is a really window in the past. Like it's like the how people looked, how people, um, uh, how buildings looked, how actually how and it's like how people we are like what they we are using in their rooms, what they we are like eating, and also it's and and how and because also like this, um, Oksana Bulgakova has also like explored like this aspect of the Soviet films that they were like they had to be educational not only about the ideals but also about the very um, uh, about the very how to behave how to cross the street how to take a shower like and all these like hints we are all disseminated in different films and so and the film somehow like provided the manual like to the population how to deal with this new life, with these new things in the new society. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,